Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. Respectable Dean of Associate Dean of uh, Medical uh, Student Education, Professor Irfanuddin, SPKO Emet. Honorable Professor Hadi Darmawan, our beloved professor, and then uh, also respectable our guest. I'm very pleased to see you, Prof. Professor Robert G. Carroll. We welcome you to this uh, lecture. The topic of today's lecture is about physiology made easy. Uh, my name is Dr. Raisa Nurwani OBGYN, and I'll be the moderator of today's guest lecture. So before the presentation begin, let me inform you that this presentation will be also streaming on our YouTube channels and then um, the, uh, the participants of this lecture, Professor, is our students, the, the newest students of our medical faculty. There are 249 of them, class of 2023. And today is their first six weeks of medical students. So they are very new and uh, still have very long journey in medical education. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, read about the Prof. Rob curriculum vitae, please. So we are very, very pleased and honored to have Prof. Rob here with us today. As we know that uh, Prof. Rob is already gave us uh, lectures in uh, Sriwijaya University for almost four years in a row, I think. But uh, uh, we are very grateful that this year we can meet in person. So uh, all the participants is uh, really, really honored to have to see Prof. Rob in person today. So Prof. Rob G. Carroll, PhD, earned his PhD in 1981 from Graduate School of Biomedical Science of University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, Newark, following his three years postdoctoral at University of Mississippi Medical Center's injection under sponsorship of Drs. Thomas E. Lohmer and Arthur C. Guyton. Uh, currently, he is a professor of physiology at Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University and also an associate dean for medical student education. <clears throat> he works his, with medical lecturers of many countries. He has a known patient for education and having many books Committee of National Board of Medical Examinator, and already give, gave lectures to many countries to promote and improve medical education around the world. Her, he is also recognized as Master of Education at Brody School of Medicine at 2002. Also have uh, Arthur C. Guyton Physiology Educator of the Year at 204, and the latest, the latest is he received a teacher award from Association of American Medical College in 2018. You can see he has so many awards and honors and already uh, write many books and journals. Uh, this session will be Today we will have a discuss, uh, the presentation from Prof. Rob first, and after that we will have the question and answer session and also discussion. And the last one we will have a conclusion session. So um, without further ado, let us, intro uh, let us welcome Prof. Rob to the stage and deliver that his speech. Oh, the 
pointer. Point. And unfortunately, that about exhausts my Bahasa Indonesia. So I'm going to have to present this lecture in English. My apologies for not being able to speak Bahasa. Um, first, congratulations. You're at the start of an exciting career. The honor of being selected to study medicine really is massive because you'll be entrusted with your patients' lives. Um, it's a huge responsibility, and it's a huge privilege to be able to perform in that arena. I've had the pleasure of working with medical students for over 40 years. So I'm going to talk today about physiology because physiology is my passion. You're passionate about uh, providing clinical care. My passion is physiology. and. In order to get to know me a little better, uh, one amusing side of my research is my PhD work was on studying blood pressure regulation in sharks. So I got to work with dogfish sharks and finding out how they control their blood pressure during exercise. Um, I'm just fascinated by research problems and by the knowledge that we can generate by doing research. So my topic today is the role of physiology in the medical curriculum. Why is it important that you learn physiology and how is that going to make your study of medicine easier and more effective? Um, as you heard in the background, I'm a professor of physiology, the former associate dean for medical student education, and I've received the Robert Glasser Award as a distinguished teacher from the Association of American Medical Schools. Um, as you look at this, as you look at the scale on the temperature gauge, you see that the degree centigrade and degree Fahrenheit are very different from each other numerically until you get down to about minus 40. Once you get to minus 40, then the two numbers actually become the same. Minus 40 Fahrenheit is the same as minus 40 in centigrade. As we look at learning, uh, there are five widely accepted learning theories. Behaviorism, cognitive learning theory, constructivism, humanism, and connectivism. Among all those theories, medical education is centered mostly on constructivism. That is, we believe knowledge is something that each individual has to construct within their own mind. The characteristics of a constructivist theory is under the cognitive construction from Jean Paget, uh, you talk about schemas, concepts. So you'll be taught a lot about, well, this is the organization. This is how you acquire the information. This is how you adapt it. This is how you bring it together within your own mind. It is essential that you learn those skills because that is the way in which you're going to master the huge amounts of information that is required in order to practice medicine. The second aspect of cognitive constructivism is that the principles, learning is an active rather than a passive process. So you have to engage with the material. Learning also has to be authentic whole and real in order to be effective. So you should not learn physiology as something separate from medicine. 
You should learn physiology as their underpinnings of medicine. Um, an example of when you learn something, but that it is not authentic. Uh, this was 15 years ago. Um, my daughter borrowed my car to go kayaking with two of her friends. And so they went out on the boat. Um, they had a good day. But when they came back, it was dark. And this was before cell phones when everybody had their own flashlights. Uh, so they had to tie the boat, the kayak, on top of the car in the dark. And when she came home, she said how difficult it was to do that in the dark out in the woods. And I looked at her and said, whose car is it? She goes, it's your car. I go, and where's the flashlight? She says, in the glove compartment. She knew the flashlight was in the glove compartment, but when put into a real situation, she could not draw on that piece of information. So you cannot learn physiology as something separate from medicine. You have to learn physiology as part of a whole. You need to be able to put it into a clinical context. So for the, if you look at the curriculum at Brody School of Medicine, um, the goal of our curriculum is to prepare the learner for success in the next component. And on this figure, I've broken one of the cardinal rules of organization because you start at the bottom. When you look at our curriculum, if you start at the bottom, it says structure. So the first thing our students do is they learn anatomy, histology, biochemistry, the structure of things. And they spend four months learning that structure. Then the next stage, they go into the second group of courses, and that course is set centered on function. So physiology, neuroscience, microbiology are in that second grouping. The anatomy courses were there to prepare our students to succeed in physiology. The physiology courses are there to prepare our students to succeed in the next group of courses, where they look at disease and therapeutics. So this will be pathology, introduction to clinical medicine, uh, pharmacology, the applied medical basic sciences. Only after all of that foundational knowledge do the students then progress into their clerkships, into the core clinical training. So each stage prepares the students for the next challenge. Reading this slide from the bottom, the pre-medical courses you took before you came in here prepared you for success when you get to the basic science courses. The basic science courses are there to prepare students for success once they enter the clerkships. Clerkships prepare the students for success in their internships. The internships prepare students for success in residency. And then finally, the residency prepares students for success in clinical practice. So on that scale, physiology is way down on the bottom. We are not trying to prepare you to be physicians. We're trying to prepare you for success when you move on to pharmacology, move on to the clinical clerkships, and we're giving you a foundational knowledge in order to accomplish that. It's backwards, okay. So when we, as our students graduate from medical school, we give them a survey. It's a long survey, it's about 70 pages. We ask them about every aspect of their medical training. One group of questions asks them, which of the foundational courses best prepared you for your clinical clerkships? So these now are students who are graduating from medical school, who are going out to their internships and residencies, and we're saying which of the foundational courses were the most important. 
93% said pathophysiology was the most important. The second one was clinical skills, how to take blood pressures, how to interact with patients. The third one was physiology. When we asked the students what was the most important thing you learned when you were in the foundational years, physiology comes out third out of the 15 different courses that they could that they had taken and only one step below learning how to interact with the patient. So the evidence from our students says that physiology is indeed the foundation for what you're going to do. So let's talk about the definition of physiology. What is physiology? At its core, physiology is a study of movement across barriers. The focus, the key concept in physiology is homeostasis. That is what the body does to keep a constant internal environment. Why does your blood pressure stay within the normal range? Why is your heart rate within the normal range? Why is your plasma potassium levels maintained within a normal range? So physiologists really like the idea of normal ranges. How the body regulates those variables is mostly through negative feedback reflexes. If your blood pressure gets too high, there's an activation of the parasympathetic nervous system and the backing off of the sympathetic nervous system to bring your blood pressure back down. If your blood pressure would drop too low, you activate the sympathetic nervous system, which then will cause your blood pressure to recover back to normal. So physiologists really like negative feedback reflexes. Um, layered on top of keeping things constant is the ability to adapt to change. If the body, instead of sitting still in your chairs, if you would get up and exercise, the body needs to adapt to that new situation. Some of those adaptations are feed forward or learned responses. And by using this framework, you'll come to view diseases as a disruption of control, and you'll be using the re remaining compensatory systems to help you make diagnosis in your diseases. So back to the concept of movement across barriers. Unfortunately, physiologists like equations. You're just going to have to get used to that. That is how we speak to each other. Instead of drawing a graph with a straight line on it, we'll put that into an equation. There's no point in taking a whole page with a graph and putting a straight line on it. One of the major equations governing movement is diffusion. If you want to know how much oxygen diffuses across the lungs and into the bloodstream, you're going to be concerned with that top equation. The J is the influx of the compound. There's a diffusion coefficient, which is characteristic for the oxygen going across an air-water interface. The surface area is important. And then the change in concentration divided by the change in distance. The reason why we like these equations is if there's a problem with oxygen delivery across the lungs, you can use the other components of the equation to try and fix it. So say you have pulmonary edema. In pulmonary edema, the increase in distance makes it harder for oxygen to get into the bloodstream. One way to help patients with pulmonary edema who have low oxygen levels is to provide supplemental oxygen. You want to increase the concentration gradient by having them breathe supplemental oxygen. Now there is enough of a drive to move the oxygen into the bloodstream in spite of the increase in diffusion distance. A second characteristic or second form of movement is osmosis, which is the movement of water. A third is transport. The area of physiology I teach is the kidney. 
the kidney tubules are full of transporters. And we will go through in my class, each of them talk about how they're regulated, what drugs you will use to alter their function, and how it works. There's ion movement, which is covered by the Nernst equation, capillary filtration, and finally for the cardiovascular and pulmonary systems, flow. Flow is equal to the change in pressure divided by resistance. So unfortunately, you will have to get used to equations. Just resign yourself to the fact that that is how physiologists communicate. The other thing that physiologists do is we provide schemas, we provide frameworks in order for you to better understand the movement of things. If you look at the box on this slide, it highlights the areas where there's an epithelial layer. The biggest epithelial layer is your skin. That skin provides a barrier between what's inside your body and what's on the outside world. As you look at the oxygen that we talked about that has to come into it, on the upper left-hand side of the figure, you have the respiratory system where oxygen has to cross an epithelial barrier in order to get into the body. If you look at the GI system, the entire GI system is lined by an epithelium. The advantage of having that epithelial barrier means the contents in the GI system can look very different from what your body looks like. So you can have different ion concentrations, you can have different solutes, you can have different water concentrations in the GI tract, which are very different from the rest of the body. The cardiovascular system just exists to transport things within the body and to keep one area of the body looking like the other areas of the body. And then finally, the urinary system is responsible for eliminating things. So as I talk about the kidney, the first step in formation of urine is filtration within the renal glomerulus. That filtration crosses an epithelial barrier. Once the compound is filtered, it is now functionally outside of the barrier outside of the body and can be um, eliminated unless you reabsorb it or secrete it. To help with your organization, physiologists try to organize things as organ systems. Um, here list five major organ systems, the cardiovascular system, respiratory, renal, GI metabolism, and the endocrine system. The reason for that is that when we have a system like the cardiovascular system, we focus on those controlled variables. So arterial blood pressure is a very tightly regulated variable for the cardiovascular system. For the respiratory system, the arterial levels of blood gases and the CNS level of CO2 is a regulated variable. If those change, they will alter how you breathe in order to bring things back into normal. The kidneys are great at regulating volume and electrolyte composition. GI metabolism regulates the nutrients, glucose, amino acids, and fats. And then the endocrine system and the nervous systems regulate most things. Those are your big control systems. So when you focus on those, um, you'll be looking more at the interaction with every organ system as you'll deal with endocrine and central nervous system. If you like the idea of control systems, at the bottom of that slide, there's a reference to a project called Human Model, QMOD by Robert Hester, and it's got over 10,000 variables that it tracks, and you can put in the information and then it will give you a very accurate description of what is going to happen next in a patient. So, back up a slide. Um, homeostasis is the idea that we want to keep our entire internal environment constant. So we're in a steady state. What goes in has to equal what goes out. 
The in is the intake plus whatever we produce. The out is the output plus whatever we consume. And then layered on top of the homeostasis is the idea that plasma levels are buffered by storage pools. So plasma calcium, plasma potassium, glucose, nutrients, the change in the plasma levels is buffered by storage pools. Okay. So you've now learned physiology, congratulations. Let's try out that cognitive constructivism. I have an observation for you to start with. Acetaminophen lowers body temperature when you have the flu, but it does not lower body temperature when you do, do not have the flu. Why? <laughs> So what I'd like you to do or what I'd like you to do is start by discussing that observation. Talk to each other and um, see if you can come up with an explanation for why when you have a flu, aspirin and acetaminophen will drop your body temperature. But if I would take aspirin now, it would not change my body temperature. Um, You've got a few minutes to talk about it, and then I would like you to try and tell me what some possible hypotheses are for this. Ya, kalian diberikan waktu beberapa menit untuk diskusi ya, Dek. Uh, diskusikan kira-kira kenapa tuh acetaminophen bisa menurunkan temperatur tubuh ketika flu, tapi kalau nggak flu, nggak bisa turun. Boleh diskusi, silahkan diskusi. Kita berikan waktu, two minutes maybe, Prof. Two or three minutes is okay. Yeah. There will be price from the committee. Right, I'll, I'll nod it down. Very good. Thank you.
Okay, let, let's see how we're going with our knowledge fund. Uh, what I would like you to do is have a couple of the students suggest what they think is going on when you give acetaminophen um, for, to somebody who has influenza. Oh. Which one, the red one or? <laughs> Please tell us your name first and class. Uh, pray forgive the discourtesy. My name is Akbar Nataramja. My guess is your body's response to being infected with the flu is that it raises its temperature. And what acetaminophen does is it would lower it back to its normal temperature, which would mean that if you're already at normal temperature, acetaminophen would do nothing because you're already normal. Thus conclude my guess. Anyone else? Yes, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Professor. Uh, let me introduce myself first. I am Imam Ropit Alhan Ashari from Bera class, and I would like to um, share with you about my opinion in this case about why is acetaminophen lowers the body temperature when you have flu but does not lower your body temperature when you do not have flu. Uh, as we know before, Professor said that in physiology, uh, is the study of movement across barrier and also homeostasis and about that is we also uh, the body is adapting to changes so what the acet acetaminophen does is lowers the body temperature when there is interference such as bacteria or virus or other pathogens so if you have a normal uh, body conditions so the acetaminophen would not work because you do not have any interference. I think that is all for me. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good. So let's put this into context. Next slide. Uh, the, the comments from the students were correct, so you guys are already way ahead of me. When you look at this graph, uh, normally body temperature is around 37 degrees centigrade. And the body works through a series of heat gain and heat loss mechanisms to keep that temperature constant. So there's some diurnal variation in temperature, but Generally, the body temperature stays right around that 37 degrees centigrade. When you get an infection, influenza, it's going to generate compounds called pyrogens. They're named pyrogens because they raise body temperature. What it does is instead of raising body temperature, it raises the set point for body temperature. So it's like taking the thermostat in the room and changing it up to a higher level. Once that happens, there's now an error signal. The body temperature is at 37 degrees centigrade. The set point or the control point is up at 39 degrees centigrade. So that sets off an error signal. The error signal activates the body's Comp com compensatory systems to try and raise body core temperature. So during the first hours of an influenza infection, you feel cold, you shiver, you decrease your body surface area. All of the things designed to conserve your core temperature. You get a cutaneous vasoconstriction so that you don't lose temperature out to the room. All of those things work together to try and get your temperature up to that set point. The shift in that set point is mediated by pyrogens. The pyrogens act through prostaglandins. 
So any of your drugs which block prostaglandin synthesis, aspirin, acetaminophen, the NSAIDs, um, will shift, will get rid of that error signal and will cause the set point to drop back down to the normal set point. So it is only the set point elevation that is mediated by prostaglandins. It doesn't have anything to do with your normal body temperature. So if I would sit up here now and take aspirin, my body temperature would not change. If you would give it to me while I have the flu, then it will drop my set point from the raised level of 39 back down to 37. If you do not treat the patient, if you would let them go for a couple days, we'll be nice and give them a form of flu that only lasts for 24 hours. Um, once the body has cleared the influenza virus, it stops producing the pyrogens. Without the pyrogens, the set point returns back down to 37 degrees centigrade. So what do you think would be the characteristics during the too hot error signal, where your body's temperature is still back up at 39, but the set point has been returned to 37? What would the body do? And is the microphone still? Oh, okay. You're fine. Is there any question? Answer that. Silakan. Apa yang akan terjadi? Apa yang dilakukan oleh tubuh kita, Teh? Kalau dia merasa bahwa sinyalnya error tuh ini terlalu tinggi. Nah, ini harus diturunkan. Apa yang harus mereka lakukan? Tubuh kita melakukan apa? Yuk. Please answer. Raise your hand. Ada yang sudah pernah baca? Siapa yang berani? Ini nih sudah kelar terlalu tinggi nih. Ah ini harus diturunkan nih. Ya, apa yang dia lakukan? Apa yang tubuh kita lakukan? Ayo. Dikasih hadiah nih kalau bisa jawab ini. Ayo dicoba yuk. Ya, coba. Silakan. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh um, I would like to introduce myself first My name is M. Fatan Asfagustian I'm from the Alpha class And I would like to share my opinion on the case about What the body will do if it wants to Bring down the 39 degrees Celsius to 37 uh, I think personally, the body will try to adapt and try to get that high temperature to low temperature by uh, excrements and sweating and things like that. Anything to try and get the high temperature to lower temperature again. So yeah, basically anything can change to a normal time. So yeah, that is all. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. And that is correct. Okay. So, which one of the three answer is the best one? <laughs> you choose now. Because we have the prize for him. Ah, okay. okay. The, the first one was, was the, best, the first answer for why the so, origins. This is the first for the first? Yeah, the first speaker. Okay. First speaker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, by using, or what happens is, if the set point is down at 37, but your actual body temperature is up at 39, then the individual tries to offload temperature. The blood vessels will dilate. 
so that you can lose heat more easily to the environment. You will start to sweat. Uh, you will do every, you will spread out, you'll get out from under the blankets and you'll expose yourself to the air so that more heat can be liberated. So by using physiology and just the idea of a set point, you can take something like the body temperature changes that happen with the flu. And when my children were young and they would say, oh, I don't feel good. I don't want to go to school today. I think I'm sick. I think I have the flu. And they say, well, how do you feel? They say, oh, I feel really hot. I said, get to school. Yeah, you don't have the flu. Um, however, if they wake up in the morning and their skin, the blood vessels are constricted, they say, oh, I feel really cold. And you take their body temperature and it's 37. Don't send them to school. Within two hours, their body temperature is going to be 39. The school is going to call you. You'll have to go get the kid from school. So you've already lost. Uh, so you might as well just say, okay, yeah, we're staying home today. Um, I do think you're sick. So by using physiology, you can take all of the common signs of something like the flu. You feel hot. You feel cold. You're sweating. You're shivering. Um, you want to curl up. Uh, you want to expose, you get out from under the blanket. You want to, your skin is constricted, your skin is dilated. You can take all of those symptoms, which are the exact opposite of each other, and put them into a context where you don't have to memorize any of that. By understanding the mechanism, the cognitive load is reduced because you no longer have to memorize something. And as you're going through your studies, that's going to be one of the key characteristics. You're going to be looking for those models. You're going to be looking for those schema to help you avoid memorizing things. Because if you memorize something, the answer is gone too quickly. If you understand it, then you don't have to work hard at memorizing it, and it stays with you. Okay. So the way the body adapts to flu, uh, following the infection, the sh set point shifts upward. You get a too cold error signal. That signal is mediated by pyrogens. Uh, it's an adaptive response. And the shift in set point is blocked by the compounds that block prostaglandin. So aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen. Then if you wait 24 to 48 hours, then the influenza virus is cleared from the body. There are no longer any pyrogens being produced and the set point returns to normal. Now your body generates a too hot error signal and it will offload the body temperature through sweating, through cutaneous vasodilation, um, through behavioral mechanisms, so that, you can, uh, so that you can get your body temperature back to where it belongs. So, next slide. Physiologists love concept maps. Uh, this concept map talks about how thermal, how the body regulates temperature. The stimulus is up at the top part of the map. It will either be a change in the environmental temperature, which is sensed by peripheral thermoreceptors on your skin, or else it will be a change in core body temperature, which is sensed in the central hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is also the site for the regulatory center. So all of that information comes into the hypothalamus and it compares what the body core temperature actually is with what the set point is. If, there's, if those two match, nothing happens. Your body temperature is where it belongs. If you have an increase in body temperature, then that's gonna work through the sympathetic cholinergic neurons which are going to activate sweat glands, which allows you to lose heat 
through um, evaporative cooling. It is also going to work to dilate the cutaneous blood vessels, which will also, which will allow you to lose heat to the environment. In contrast, on the right-hand side of the figure, if your body temperature is lower than that set point, then you will still work through the sympathetic adrenergic neurons to cause a constriction of the cutaneous blood vessels, which will allow you to conserve heat. Uh, you'll work through the somatic motor neurons to increase activity in skeletal muscle, which will cause thermogenesis. And then one other characteristic for other animals do it better than humans do, hibernating animals in particular, have a lot of brown fat. Brown fat, when there's a sympathetic activation, causes a non-shivering thermogenesis. So it generates heat. Newborn babies have a lot of brown fat. They use this to regulate their body core temperature because their sympathetic control of blood flow is not well developed. So instead of relying on controlling skin blood flow, newborn babies rely on brown fat in order to generate heat if their body temperature low, gets too low. And newborn babies are very bad at thermoregulation. So that's why they're always wrapped up in blankets right after birth because they have not yet, um, their nervous system is not sufficiently mature to allow them to regulate body temperature effectively. Um, after a couple days, it gets better, and then uh, it's no longer, the keeping them wrapped up and warm is no longer nearly as important. So those were all the set point and the negative feedbacks. There's a whole nother grouping of control systems called positive feedbacks. Uh, one example for this would be if you would get into a hot tub. Your body gets warm. If the hypothalamus detects that the body's getting warm, so it increases cutaneous blood flow. Well, you're increasing your blood flow in a warm environment, so you're now actually gaining heat from a mechanism that's supposed to cool you off. So a characteristic of a positive feedback system is a disturbance leads to a larger disturbance leads to an even larger disturbance. Um, for microphones, when you get a feedback on a microphone, that is a positive feedback, where the noise from the speaker gets picked up by the microphone, gets amplified, the noise from the speaker further gets picked up by the microphone and gets amplified. Um, it's not always pathological. There are a number of instances in the body where positive feedbacks are how things work. There's a sodium entry into the cells during an action potential is a positive feedback. Uh, the LH surge during ovulation is a positive feedback. Around pregnancy, there's a hormone called oxytocin, which is involved in partruition and also in lactation. Those are both positive feedbacks. And the physiologist in me is, finds it curious that the one hormone that is involved in positive feedback is involved in two separate instances of positive feedback. The last type of control are the feed-forward responses. These are adaptive or learned. So for thermoregulation, if you're going out into a cold environment, you put on your coat before you go out. Negative feedback says you would go outside, get cold, and then come back in and get your coat. Feed-forward says, last time I went outside and it was cold, my body temperature drops. I'm gonna put on a coat before I go out there. And when you look at how blood pressure is regulated during exercise, it is regulated by a feed forward control mechanism. Um, so feed forward or feed forward responses are yet that final types of response control systems that physiologists will emphasize. 
So when all else fails, physiology becomes much simpler when you use normal values to anchor your logic. So for partial pressure, or when you look at mixed venous gases, alveolar and arterial blood gases, for the partial pressure of oxygen, mixed venous PO2 is around 40, arterial is up around 97 to 100. Sometimes you just have to memorize things. Typical values you just need to memorize. And I can promise you when you get into a clinical setting, anybody wearing a white coat has already memorized these values. They are just essential for anchoring your ability to interpret what's going on with a patient. So the oxygen content, the CO2 levels, the oxygen levels, if you're involved in any aspect of evaluating the pulmonary system, you will run back to those normal values as your anchor points. So pay attention to the anchor points and memorize the typical values. So the other way to look at control systems is to characterize diseases based on where they fit into those concept maps. Um, this is a section from a book that I authored and it looks at a bunch of different endocrine diseases and then where they fit into an endocrine concept map. Next slide. This slide just shows a blow up of part of that map. So when you look at the female reproductive system, the anterior hypothalamus puts out a gonadotropin releasing hormone that is going to go down and get to the pituitary where it's going to cause the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. The follicle stimulating hormone is going to cause the ovarian follicle to mature. And because of that, the maturing follicle is going to secrete estrogen. That estrogen provides a negative feedback on the FSH levels. The estrogen also causes the uterine endometrium to grow to proliferate. The right-hand side of that is after the FSH and LH surge are going to be involved in ovulation, the release of the egg from the ovary. Once the egg is released, then the remaining parts of the follicle become the corpus luteum or the yellow body. Ovulation will allow the ovum to go into the fallopian tube and if it is not fertilized, it gets lost from the body. If it is fertilized, it then becomes a blastocyst, which is going to implant onto the uterine endometrium. The corpus luteum is going to produce progesterone. Initially, it produces it for two weeks. If there's a blastocyst form, then the blastocyst is going to secrete another hormone, HCG, which is going to keep the corpus luteum secreting progesterone. And that means that the endometrium is going to remain in the secretory phase and it will inhibit uterine smooth muscle contraction to allow the egg to successfully implant. The reason why um, physiologists, physiology and medicine line up so closely is when you look at these six clinical cases, you can plot where each of them falls within that uh, concept map for the endocrine system. So case number 79 is polycystic ovary syndrome, where the over, where multiple follicles are maturing at the same time, and you get very high levels of estrogen. Uh, the estrogen is also going to be, or be some of it will be converted into testosterone. The second case would be endometriosis, where you have uterine endometrial tissue in a place which is not the uterus. Case 81 is an ectopic pregnancy where the ovum is fertilized, but instead of implanting in the uterus, it implants in the fallopian tubes. 
Uh, you can get a placental abruption, um, preeclampsia, or gestational diabetes, all of which can be tagged to places within that concept map. So as you're going through reproductive medicine, the diseases that you're going to be taught about all have a home within the normal physiology. By viewing diseases as a disruption of normal physiology, then you're able to better understand the disease and just not have to memorize so much in order to what are the symptoms, how does this work? So an example of the case um, is set up in a problem-based learning format where you had the clinical presentation. A 24-year-old woman presents to her gynecologist with concerns. She compares of irregular menstrual periods that are heavy, dark coarse hairs growing on her face, upper arms, chest, and abdomen. Uh, she complains about persistent acne. She's married without children. She and her husband have been trying to conceive a child for about three months, but have been unsuccessful. So this is how the patient presents to you. You're going to take that clinical presentation and then combine with the results of a physical examination and laboratory studies, you'll be able to figure out um, why exactly um, the patient's symptoms are appearing. So patient symptoms are characteristic of disordered physiology. Now, why physiology likes problem-based learning in clinical cases is in order to understand that case, the students have to understand the menstrual cycle, physiology of ovulation, physiology of dominant follicles, follicular production of estrogen, the fecal cell production of testosterone, and then it gets into management where there's estrogen-based birth control pills and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. That is the core of physiology. It is also the core of this patient's clinical case. So you look to relate those two and to apply your knowledge of physiology to the clinical context. This next slide shows the same approach, but now looking at the respiratory system. I'd like you to focus, it starts off with the barometric pressure and it ends up with mitochondrial production of ATP. But instead of going through the whole map, I'd like you just to focus on the top component of the figure. So if you wanna know what the alveolar oxygen concentration is within your lungs, you're gonna be concerned with the barometric pressure and the composition of the gas. What was the percentage of oxygen in that inspired gas? You're also going to be concerned with how much air is coming in and out of the lungs. What is the alveolar ventilation? For the alveolar ventilation, that's going to be determined by the lung volumes, the lung function, and then the dead space, the areas of the airways that do not participate in gas exchange. What physiologists do is they study things, they collect data on things, they test. So the small lines underneath each of those boxes talk about diagnostic tests that are used to gain information about it. If I'm interested in lung volumes, I can look at that through plethysmography or helium dilution. If I wanna know lung function, I can look at spirometry or pressure volume compliance curves. If I wanna know what the dead space component is, I can look at CO2 dilution or the single breath O2 nitrogen test. So for, for that entire concept map, you as clinicians have access to tools which are going to let you understand, let you figure out what is, where the disruption is. Okay, next one. That same concept map can be used to categorize diseases. So if you look at the, if you have a decreased percentage of inspired gas, that's a concern. 
Um, if, there, if you're up at altitude, the barometric pressure dropped. Both of those would influence the alveolar PO2. Uh, scoliosis, fibrosis are going to alter your lung volumes. Asthma, COPD, emphysema, the other diseases will alter your lung function. So you can take all of the diseases that you'll be studying when you're in pulmonology and relate them back to, okay, that changes my lung function, therefore this will impact alveolar ventilation and my PO2. So you'll be able to track the clinical presentations more effectively. Okay. So this last slide deals with a clinical case from a program called Aquifer. Um, during COVID, we would not let our students near a patient who had a cough because we were afraid that the students would become sick. That means we graduated students from our school who had never worked with a patient who had a cough. Instead of exposing them to a patient, these are book cases. These are simulations where the patients have, where the students can go through the case and look at the clinical symptoms and backtrack things. Every one of the cases has this type of a mechanism of disease map to it. To read the map, the black squares are the patient's symptoms. So the patient is going to present with dyspnea. When, they're in, when This is a patient with heart failure. The patient presents with dyspnea, jugular venous distension, crackles, pulmonary peripheral edema, fatigue and exercise intolerance, and there will be a heart sound, an abnormal heart sound, an S3 gallop. Next slide. If you would pick just one of those, or one grouping of those, the jugular venous distension, the peripheral edema, and the lung function, everything on that graph in purple is physiology. So they split the graph back down to the basic sciences. The red is neuroscience. So what happens to the patient is They've got an increase in left atrial pressure, an increase in pulmonary venous pressure, engorging the pulmonary capillaries. That is going to cause edema, fluid movement into the space, which will cause the crackles. Uh, the increased pulmonary, or, sorry, pulmonary artery, right atrium and right ventricle pressures and systemic venous pressures will cause peripheral edema. Those will also cause jugular venous distension. So again, you can go back to the diseases and the clinical presentations and use those, relate that to the physiology in order to understand the mechanism underlying the disease. Okay. So the whole purpose of this talk was to try and convince you that physiology makes it easier to learn medicine. You can just ask the graduating students. They tell you that physiology was one of the most useful things that they learned in order to prepare them for success when they entered their clinical clerkships. Okay. And with that, we have time for questions. Uh, during the COVID environment, my body absorbed so much sanitizer that when I peed, it cleaned the toilet. Uh, okay. Questions about what we've gone over today. Yeah, we welcome maybe three questions first, Professor. Okay. Is there any questions from the floor? You can raise your hand. Okay, two best questions will get the prize. <laughs> okay, please stand up. Please tell us your name first. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Pauline Deremi. I am from the class of Gamma 2023. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's, it is an honor to speak uh, in front of you guys here today indeed. So my question is, uh, from the professor's explanation before, uh, we know that homeostasis is always works in a human body in order to adapt to the environment. And 
I would like to know if there's any possibility that when we really meet the barriers, when we really stop from doing this homeostasis in our lives, I mean, is there any possibility that we fail to adapt to the environment? And my second question is, if that permitted, uh, what happened with people uh, with some sort of uh, autoimmune disease? What happened with their homeostasis? Thank you very much. Okay, what kind of disease? Autoimmune. Autoimmune. Immune. Autoimmune, like maybe oh, systemic lupus. Yes. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, the, the first question is unfortunately going to be increase, increasingly relevant as you go out and practice. The environment is changing and we will not be able to treat our way out of the healthcare burden, which is going to be caused by environmental change. So the idea that we need to treat our world better is very real. Now, humans are not adapted to survive in many environments. So the Western part of the United States has a desert environment. Um, humans cannot survive long in that environment without supplemental water, um, without other necessary components. So yes, it is possible to put someone in an environment that, is, that the body is not capable of surviving on. Um, one other characteristic is um, fluid intake. Indonesia is surrounded by salt water. Can humans drink salt water and survive? No. And it's because the maximum urine osmolarity, the amount of sodium and chloride we can lose in the urine, is less than what the or what the sodium and chloride is in the ocean. So when we would ingest ocean water, we would be taking in more salt than we can lose in our urine. And that's why drinking salt water, even if you're dehydrated, uh, will not help you. It will cause you to die. The, let's see. So yeah, hum humans can place themselves in situations where they cannot adapt to the environment. Other species can. Um, if you look at seagulls, they can ingest salt water because they can put out a much more concentrated um, secretions to get rid of the excess salt that is in the water. The second component was autoimmune disease. So an autoimmune disease is caused by a malfunction of the immune system, something that is in, should be recognized as a self protein, something that belongs in your body, is characterized as a non-self or a threat protein, and the body sets up an immune response against that protein. So autoimmune diseases are a malfunction of the immune system um, rather than a problem with homeostasis. And I will let your immunology instructors uh, take you through that side of life because I never had immunology, so I don't know what's going on there. Okay. Um, do you want to add another questions, or is it clear? Uh, it's all clear. Thank you very much. Okay. So, is there any other questions from the floor? Please. Which one, Prof? Okay, where is the people from the right side? Where is the students from the right side? Please. Yep. We need your answer. Your okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Zaskia Sabrina from Beta Class. So, uh, as a doctor, when we face the patient, uh, the, the attitude that we must have to uh, that we have to maintain are togetherness, passion, politeness, and collaborations. But in the real case, 
Many doctors or health workers are irritable and impatient when they face their patient in distress condition. And also in the reality, we as human has our own characteristic and behavior, which are one of them is that I mentioned before, like impatient un and easy to get angry. So based on the cases, I would like to ask the question, how we change the, this attitude like impatient and get easy to angry to be more patient and kind, both in real life and in professional as a doctor from psychology side. Thank you. Okay. Could, could you repeat that? Okay. My, my, my ears are still stuffed up from the airplane ride, <laughs> so I'm not hearing as well as I should. Okay, I will, I will try to uh, give the conclusion. The, the question is, uh, how can we change our own um, physiology, uh, physiological uh, state like uh, uh, impatience and then easily get angry, how we change that so we can be uh, good doctors and some things like that, I think. Is it correct? Okay. Yes. How we, yeah. So the... One of, one of the characteristics of good physicians is the ability to relate to the patients. So um, finding ways to behaviorally separate yourself as you're caring for the patient is very important so that you can provide the best care in the patient's interest. Um, but that to me gets more on the clinical skills side of things rather than physiology. Did I misunderstand the question? Yeah, maybe she asked about the physiological, physical, physiology, uh, psychological, psychological, yeah. yeah. Is there anything we can do to maybe yeah. to improve our own behaviors? Yeah. Um, learn, learning to take care of yourself is essential to being an effective student, to being an effective physician. So the psychological balance is something that you're going to have to overcome. For example, for our students, after the first month of medical school, we then meet with them in small groups and talk about what they're doing to care for themselves. Are they still exercising? Are they still um, taking time out to have appropriate activities? And most, mostly the answer is no. Uh, the workload is too heavy. They're too focused on the work. So coaching them to find ways to make time to care for themselves as individuals is, is essential to um, being good learners, being good students, and being um, effective. So I, I may not look it, but I actually exercise a fair amount. Um, I got up at 6 o'clock this morning and went on the treadmill for an hour. Um, this is necessary for me in order to keep my heart strong, uh, to take care of my body. So you also are going to have to find ways to make time in your very busy lives to care for yourselves because if you're exhausted, grumpy, you're not going to be able to provide good care to your patients. So what maybe there is like additional question for this question, Rob. Okay. Is it any explanation by using the homeostasis how to change our neuro behavior, the, the relation between psychological and physiological yes. in neurophysiology for that? Yes, and okay. I'm experiencing part of that now. Um, biologically, it's about 10 o'clock at night in the U.S., and so my time shift, my time zones are shifted. Um, 
I did not sleep well on the flight over, so I have a sleep deficit. So all of the things that you are going to be facing when you're on night call, when you're working night shift, um, it, it is tough to find, to try and find ways to adapt to uh, the changes, but it is important that you do work to try and take care of yourself as you go through. So which means that it's very important for us to keep our like biorhythmic balance yes. to keep our minds healthy. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Prof. Rob. Thank you for the questions. Is there any other questions? Okay. Please. Good morning, Mr. Carroll. My name is Muhammad Iqdal Falchandra, and I'm a first-year medical student, Faculty of Medicine, Sriwijaya University. First of all, I want to say thank you for this change. It's an honor for me to be in the same room with an amazing person like you. All right, to start the question, so I have followed some news about the current global issue, in which that people around the globe start worrying about the future of this planet. I remember last year, there was a scientist protest to stop global warming, and they even said that as far, we just have three years until 2025 to fix it. And on the other hand, I see an incredible development of technology for the past 20 years. After the invention of the internet that turns, out, turns our world to be more globally and caused the development of technology to be more dynamic and progress exponentially, it brings us to the invention of artificial intelligence. So I had heard the news about how AI, such as ChatGPT, can pass the USMLE test. Logically, if that AI can pass the USMLE test that standardized the test for top 10 and so university of the world, it also can easily pass the test here in my country, Indonesia, in which even the best faculty of medicine is just on top 600 or so. What worried me as a future generation slash future doctor is that there's a discourse that called us post-humanism that believed to be the era of artificial intelligence. The thing is, the artificial intelligence this can be a real and plausible solution for our climate issue. And if the AI really can be the solution, then it will be the solution for our medical problem too. And, that, and if that really the case, I think there is no reason for me to get into college and learn about medical school. So my question is, do you think that AI will take over that we, future doctor, privilege to help people? And also, is there any ability of a doctor that you believe can be replaced by the AI technology? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. A, a great question. So, I, I go to a physician for my care. When I go to the physician, I've already gone online. I've looked up all my symptoms. I've looked up the incidents. So I'm coming to the, my caregiver with a lot of knowledge already. This is what the AI can do. So if you think that you are only here to provide information to a patient, then you will rapidly be replaced by AI. That is not your job. Your job is to be a caregiver. So even though I have information available to me, I still go to my physician for medical care and I have a very informed discussion with her about my medical care. Um, but if you think that the only thing that you are doing in school is learning knowledge, then yes, AI is going to replace um, that aspect of your job. My sense is you're learning to interact with people. You're going, the interpersonal skills, the care delivery is what you bring unique to the table that cannot be replicated by AI. So that, that is where your focus needs to be. You need to have the knowledge fund, but um, it does not, but that's not where it stops. Uh, for physicians, we talk about competencies. It's knowledge, skills, and attitudes. 
the skills and attitudes are the components that the AI cannot replace. The knowledge part, you're very correct. And the USMLE test is purely a knowledge exam. It can, it can perform on that, but it lacks the skills and it lacks the attitudes. Now, I'm also old enough that I've seen technological changes, each of which were predicted to make universities obsolete. Um, as soon as videotapes, recorded lectures were available, they said, okay, we'll just get the best teacher to give an hour lecture, and then we can shut down the universities. The students can all just watch the videotape, the recorded lecture. I've seen the internet, the same thing. Well, everyone can go online and find out about um, their disease process. They'll type in their symptoms. It'll spit out, uh, this is your most likely diagnosis. And so that's going to replace universities. That's going to replace physicians. It has not. The thing that is missing and why physicians exist and why universities exist is the interpersonal interactions. People learn because, not because I'm magic, not because I'm helping things, but because I care about their learning and because I'm working with them to enhance their learning. Um, that's why universities exist. That's why we've all taken the job of being instructors because we truly feel that is an important calling. That is why you have all chosen to become physicians. It is the interpersonal skills which separates the knowledge from the, from the AI that only focuses on knowledge. Thank yeah, you, Shaman, for the answer. Yeah, I think uh, it's already answered very well. S is there any other questions from the floor? Oh, so many questions, Prof. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. We, yeah, um, the ladies first. Uh, good morning, professors, and good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity that you gave me. So my name is Hana Marchanti Andrianto. I'm from the Gamma class. Uh, from what you explained before, there is a positive feedback from our body. So like when we're on a hot tub, we will uh, feel the condition of hyperthermia. Uh, my question is, is it possible that our body will respond differently? Like when we're hot tub, we will feel the hypo hypothermia. And if it's possible, like how could it happen? Uh, that's my question. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Um, so the, I'll repeat the question, make sure I got it straight. The question is, can the body change how it responds to things like temperature challenges? So in Indonesia, there's not a big annual change in temperature. In my part of the United States, there is. Uh, we will get snow in the winter time. We'll have days like this or in the 30, 32 range in the summertime. A temperature which I perceive as being cold in November, I'll, con I'll consider that being warm in the following, Jan or in the following March. So the body does change its thermal regulation based on environmental cues. Uh, thyroid hormone is involved in that. So in addition to a daily change in body temperature, there's an annual change in body temperature regulation. And it's mediated by changing your metabolism, mostly tied to thyroid hormone. So as a physiologist, I'm always amazed at how adaptable the body is and how humans can adapt to live up at the very high altitudes in the Himalayas or the very warm environments um, in, the, in the desert um, of Arabia. So the body will adapt if given time to adapt 
two different environmental challenges. It won't, it can't adapt to all of them. Things will still kill you, uh, but it can adapt to very broad ranges of environments. Is it answered the questions? Yes, it's answered the question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Prof, maybe you can sit down and <laughs> drink some water if you wish. Because I, I still see someone is raising their hands, so maybe it will take more time. Is there any other questions? Wow. And maybe the girl with uh, gray veil first, because she already raised her hand for several times. Um, okay. Thank you so much for the chance. My name is Nimas Fararamania. Uh, I'm from Gamma class. Uh, so I want to ask about from the temperature explanation before that is that true that compress really effective for fever? Since we are trying to reduce it from outside, I want to know because uh, um, maybe because it's from the outside part like the room temperature or from the compress itself and if it does work how does it work is it work on hot hot or cold situation and what will our body feedback response does it rise the temperature set thank you so much uh, sorry can you repeat the question is it true sorry we don't get it oh, can yeah. you repeat it uh, so my question is, uh, what will body react from the outside when we got a fever? Since we are trying to reduce it from outside from compress, I guess. Um, if we got fever, then um, someone is uh, tell us to put some uh, hot, uh, wet, uh, hot clothes and put it on our forehead or our armpit and she has asked how it can reduce our uh, body temperature. Okay. Uh, thank you. A, a very good question and I'll go back to my experience with my children. When m my son was about 10 years old, he had a very high fever. It was up above 104. And we took him to the emergency department. And at that time, I had a faculty appointment in the emergency department. The regulations said that they could not release the child from care until his temperature dropped below 104. Now, they tested him. There was not spinal meningitis. There was not any of the very serious diseases that cause very high pressures. So it was just he had a high pressure or a high temperature in response to the flu. In order to be able to release him legally from the emergency department, they put the ice packs under his armpits, they put the ice on the back of his head, and they did everything they could to get his temperature down to 103.9 at which point they said, get him out of here. So it is possible to um, use treatments to lower temperature um, in patients separate from a pharmacological approach. Um, the, why you would do that, there are only a very few select times I would think you would try and do that. And one, one of them is to make sure that you're staying within legal regulations. Uh, generally, the increase in body temperature that happens with the influenza is a protective response. If you do not, if you let the temperature stay elevated, the patient gets better faster. Um, if you use Tylenol, if you use aspirin to drop their temperature down, they stay sick longer. They don't feel as bad because there's a pain relief component. But for our children, if they did not need the Tylenol for pain, we just let the temperature stay high and, and let the body clear the influenza. But 
yes, it is possible to use physical mechanisms to override what the body is doing. Yeah, so um, the conclusion is it is possible that we can use ice packs or uh, wet clothes to help the body to lower the body temperature. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah, another question, maybe from the right side? The right side first. Good morning, everyone. My name is Falisha Molifa Ginting from Beta Class 2023. And I just want to extend a question from like two questions ago. You said that our body will um, adapt to the wherever we are. So, and I wanted to ask like if this adaptation extends to the normal rates that you um, that you displayed before. Like if say does someone in Africa versus someone in America, does their heart rate maybe like are they different? And do we, if so, do we as doctors need to know where, where is the patient from and take that into account? Thank you very much. Um, a good question. And yes, given air travel and how quickly people can move from one place to another, what is normal for them may not be normal uh, in their new environment. Um, for example, when our military sends soldiers to the Arabian area, to the desert, for the first two weeks, they have to increase their water intake dramatically to keep up with sweating. After about two or three weeks, they can back off on their water intake. The body has become better and more acclimated to that new um, environment. Uh, the, the sweat in the U.S. has a certain concentration of sodium and chloride. When you go and you're adapted to the desert environment, it has a much lower sodium and chloride concentration because your body is conserving salt. It can't afford to lose as much salt as I would if I was exposed to a warm environment. So the physiology does change. Um, but the normal values for blood pressure, um, plasma electrolytes, stay fairly constant even over a very wide range of settings. The only one that I can think of that would be abnormal would be people who grew up in the Himalayas would have a very different pulmonary system. They naturally have pulmonary artery hypertension as part of their adaptation to the environment, where a level that we would consider a disease, for me, is considered normal for that individual. So sometimes their background can, can impact it, but it has to be a real significant, like Himalayas down to sea level kind of comparison. Let's also emphasize that um, what Prof. Rob has had said before, that you guys are going to be a caregiver. So you have to uh, put your patient into consideration for their personal issues as an individual, right, that Prof? So that's why you need to uh, understand the physiology first and then put them into context. Thank you very much, doctor and professor. Yeah, is there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, good morning, professor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Imam Rapat Alhan Asari. And as we know that uh, in this um, globalization era and the advancement of technology such as AI and chat GPT and everything, I would like to know your opinion on how important it is technological advan advancement, especially in medical health. And if so, how does it play an important role, especially in America? And then, that is the first question. I'd like to uh, ask another question. 
that is uh, more like a personal question uh, outside of the topic for you as a physiology expert. So, um, recently, I've been seeing from the internet about the medical health system in the United States of America. And people, a lot of people, the citizens of America is complaining about uh, the health system of America. So my question is, I really would like to know your opinion about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the second question first. Um, in the United States, we have a disease system. We do not have a health system. All of our focus is on treating disease, not on maintaining health. That has to change. Um, in the last 10 years, our regional hospitals, the healthcare in a region is being evaluated better on control of blood sugar and diabetics, um, the topics which are necessary to promote health. And that's the only place where the United States actually has a health focus is on prenatal care. Um, the health system figured out a long time ago it was easier to provide prenatal care for everybody than it was to treat the couple of uh, babies who would be born with diseases that could have been prevented by prenatal care. But after that, the, the system is focused almost exclusively on diseases. Um, I only see my physician if I have a complaint, if I have a disease process I have concern about. I am, because of my background, I'm involved in a lot more surveillance uh, testing to make sure that everything is okay. But that's because I'm a physiologist in a medical center and I know to pay attention to these things. The average American would not. Uh, now, what was the first question? The first, the first question is about the EI on medical, uh, medical, uh, medical, medical in, industry in America. How do you think about that? DEI. No, medical. How do you think about DEI, acti uh, artificial intelligence in medical, maybe medical equipment or? Yeah. I think the impact of AI is inevitable, um, much like the impact of the internet. So we have to recognize it as a tool, use it for what it can do best as a tool, but it is only a tool. Um, and the same thing applies to the internet. The internet is an example of a tool that has been misused because anybody can post anything on the internet and the physicians spend a lot of time talking patients out of information that they read on the internet. Uh, so the AI hopefully will be a little more selective in what it learns from. Is it answer your question? All right, thank you so much, Professor, for the question. I think that's enough. Okay. And uh, is there any other question? Maybe the last two questions? Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for the giving chains. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Arshanti Diyanatania. I'm from the class Gamma. Um, but first, I need to approve this to you, Professor Robert. Is that okay that I'm asking a little about your background? Is it okay that I ask about your background, like your study? Oh, and she wants to ask about your background. My background? Yeah. Yes. Is it okay? Oh, how to be success. Okay. Yeah. 
it's a simple question actually. I just want to ask, um, why did you choose physiology as your uh, main field? Like, is there any particular reasons or experience that make you decide that physiology is your thing? And can you share to us as a freshman on how to find our own passion in medical field? Uh, because I find it interesting, interesting that you say that you have a passion in physiology and I want to have that kind of passion in the future as well. That's all. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so career advancement. You, all of you currently are undifferentiated physicians, just like a stem cell. We have no idea whether you're going to be a pulmonologist, a uh, family physician, emergency medicine. Um, you will make those decisions as you go through your training. So let me talk to you about the, the things that shaped my training. Um, when I was young, my father died of brain cancer. So I was around hospitals a lot um, when I was young. And because of that, I don't like sick people. Sick people give me the willies. They just, I don't want to be around sick people. Um, so I have a very bad temperament for someone who wants to be a physician. Um, the, but I always was fascinated by science and by how things work. So when I was at university and I took a course in physiology, and they said, well, you can study physiology. And I said, so I get to study normal things. And they said, yes. I go, okay, now we have a deal. Now, after I chose my field, and that's going to be a personal decision based on your personal values. The best piece of advice I got when I was young was to look at what you were doing on your nights and your weekends and find a way to make that more of your eight to five job. Because that's where your passion is. The things that you will take time out from your personal life in order to work on are the things that you care about. So for me, it was teaching. When I was doing my research, the research was eight to five in the lab, write grants, but if I was working on nights and weekends, it was getting ready for lectures. It was getting ready for my teaching. So I found ways to make the teaching part of my life a larger part of my position. And I became involved in curriculum design, uh, student assessment, things like that. So the, the whole goal is to find out what you really care about. And for me, the best advice that I got was look at what you're doing on the nights and the weekends because that's what you really care about. Wow, that's very insightful. For I is that yeah, that's Answer enough. Thank you very much. Yeah, so very nice questions, and I hope it can give insight to any of you guys here. So we come to the last questions. Wow, there are so many questions. <laughs> Please, Prof, Prof, which one do you want? You want to? <laughs> oh, the front one, okay. Uh, hello, my name is Muhammad Darpesin Otama from Gamma Class. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to, to let me question you. Uh, my question is, uh, First, we know that hemo hemo hem homeostasis is all about adapt ad adapting to our environment or to change. Feeling fear is how we adapt to scary or intimidating things. My question is, is emo emotion such as fear or anger is part of he homeostasis? If it is, are those emotions a positive feedback or negative feedback? Thank you. Okay. okay. Yes, that's a very good, a very good question. So. How does the emotional state influence the physiology? And one of the other things that I do is I played rugby and I coached rugby for 30 years. So I'm very interested in sports and how to perform athletically and stress. Um, one of my friends 
is a policeman. And one of the characteristics of a highly stressful environment, a strong fight or flight response, is that you lose your fine motor control at the expense of gaining strength in your large muscle group control. Military, uh, police, anybody who has a gun has to learn to diminish their stress response because aiming a weapon is a fine motor skill. So they have to undergo a lot of training under stress-inducing environments so that they can adapt and not respond to the stress. Some of it you can be trained out of, the sympathetic nervous system you can be trained out of. Um, there have been studies on flight nurses, nurses that go up in helicopters. They can be trained out of their sympathetic response to getting in a helicopter and going up in the air, but their cortisol response is the same as the very first day that they did it. So some aspects of the stress response you can be trained out of, some aspects of it you cannot be trained out of. Yeah, I hope that's answered the question. So some aspect can be trained. So you have to train yourself so that can, you can manage your anger or your anxiety later. Thank so you, we Professor. finally come to the end of this guest lecture sessions. Before I close, I would like to take the conclusions from what Prof. Rob Carroll has presented. Uh, so physiology is like gadgets. We just have to get used to it. And disease is just disruptions of our control system or our homeostasis. By using physiology, you'll find the sign of symptoms and can put it on a context so you don't have to memorize uh, all of the other aspect. If you memorize, it won't last, but when you understand it, you don't have to memorize it. So. Um, I'd like to thank Prof. Rob for a very informative and interesting presentation. And also, I would like to thank all the students and the participants of these lectures. Actually, Prof. Rob said to me that um, if the student cannot ask in English, you can try to translate it. And I said, I believe their English is better than me. So I no need for me to uh, translate it. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, Raisa. Raisa. Oh yeah, we forgot. Forgot the prize. Two, two best questions. Two best questions. Which, Which one? one? The question about what? The, the very first of the AI questions. The AI question, the, the first, first question. One. Siapa yang bertanya pertama kali tentang AI oh, yeah. tadi? Ya, silakan berdiri. One Satu more. ke depan, ke depan. And the last one. About the career. The career of a physiologist, the last one. Okay. Yang bicara tentang physiologi tadi. Forward? Ya, 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 ya. Sini, maju ke depan semua. Maybe yeah. we can take pictures okay. with them. Rob, please give the, the prize for them. Rob, Rob will give. The... Huh? Yeah, sama sini maju juga, maju juga si itu. Ya, ya. Couples. Eso sí, foto.
lagi dulu dia had a, a photo session for all of you. Ya. Yeah. So Rob, can you? Uh, no, no. I think how about once by once? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stand here, Rob. We will call you a, a class one by one. Yeah, each class. Yeah. Okay. Alpha, beta, gamma. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Please uh, for every faculty member, please stand here. Yeah. Dr. Hari, kita panggil ke kelas Alpha dulu. Mari sini, maju semua kelas Alpha. Okay. Ada yang di atas, ada yang duduk di bawah ya. Yang laki-laki ke bawah, silakan. Ada yang di atas, ya. Di atas di sana, ya. Yo, Dr. Hari, silakan Dr. Hari. Ayo, ada yang di bawah yang laki-laki sini, sini, sini. Mundur dikit, mundur dikit, mundur dikit. Nah, laki-laki yang turun di, di, di bawah, duduk di bawah laki-laki. Di samping-samping boleh, di samping-samping boleh, di samping-samping boleh. Kami kan tapi laki-laki duduk di bawah, ya, ya samping-samping kanan kiri. Alpha ya, di atas boleh. Okay. Ya, saya juga. Ya, ada-ada cheers ya Ada-ada satu Ya, ceria satu Tiga 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 Apa tuh gaya bebasnya? Alpha, Alpha, oke Hitung satu, dua Oke, okay, ya, silakan. Please sit down again and you can do the class.
Oke, satu, dua. Oke, Thank <laughs> you. 